Hi, I'm Jeff Chalmers and welcome to the Theatre Zaudplein. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. I've been practicing on the way, Zaudplein, so hopefully that's, uh, that's okay. good, good, close enough, close enough. Um, but yeah, welcome to the Dutch Double Bass Festival. It's an absolute honor for, uh, for myself to attend. This is the first time I've been to the event. I'm sure many of you are new as well. And this year we are doing or presenting these talking bass sessions where you get to meet uh, and ask questions directly to the legends of the bass world. And this gentleman really needs no introduction. Um, so yeah, please join me in welcoming to the 2021 Dutch Double Bass Festival, it's Dave Holland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, before we get started with the questions, because I can feel the arms twitching to, to get up, I'd, I'd just like to ask Dave, Maybe you could share a little bit about uh, your programme this afternoon. What do you have in, in store for us at the, uh, at the festival? What will you be performing? Yeah, we have a selection of music that we've been uh, choosing uh, from that selection. Each night we sort of decide which ones we're going to play based on the place and how it feels and so on. And uh, we put together the programme uh, before we left uh, to do the tour. In fact, over the summer we got together several times. We did, uh, we did a week at the Blue Note in New York about a year and a half ago, and then we were supposed to do this tour last year, and well, it didn't happen for obvious reasons. Um, so anyway, the music's a mixture of mostly original compositions, yeah. some of John's and some of mine. And then we, we might throw a jazz standard in there if we feel like it. So Is yeah. this your first tour with John as a duo? Is it this, is, yeah, yeah, it is. I was looking back at your catalogue, and obviously you've worked to, you know, in a, <laughs> we're in a lot together before, but I haven't seen it yeah, in this context. Yeah, we've so. done some projects with people, you know, um, uh, and some touring together in other mm -hmm. things. But we decided to do this duo thing. I've known John a long time, and... Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes the duo situation is so intimate and nice to work in. You, you know, just the one-on-one -on -one communication and everything. And, yeah. Uh, uh, it feels it, like you a know, nice... It presents certain kind of musical uh, situations for you as a bass player yeah. to, uh, to relate to. You know, uh, the first thing you have to think about, I think, is not to try and compensate for there not being a drummer. Yes. You know, if you try and compensate for that, you find yourself playing way too much. And, uh, and so you have to kind of still keep in mind to use space in your playing, and, uh, but just keep that momentum of the music as well, of course. And, uh, you know, playing with John is very uh, enjoyable and I'll say easy in the sense that he's a great musician. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, we have had a good time playing together. This is halfway through the tour. Yeah, are there any so. other of your favorite recordings with duos? I noticed that you played on Jim Hall's, some of my, is it my best friends are bass players? He did a duo album yeah, with a collection. All, all and as, a, as a student, I was yeah. so excited because I remember listening to Scott Coley and Christian McBride and yourself. Yeah. Uh, and are there any other guitar players that you've really enjoyed working with over the years? Uh, well, many. Lionel Lueke, uh, of oh. course, is one. Kevin Eubanks. Uh, Bill Frizzell? John McLaughlin, uh, Bill Frizzell. I've been a lucky guy. Yeah. <laughs> what well, can I tell you? <laughs> Dave, that was, that was my question, but I, actually we're here to yeah, answer the questions for these, from the audience. So who'd like to go first and um, put your question to Dave Holland? Please don't be shy. Raise your hand uh, and if you could shout out a question for us. And I might repeat it just so everyone in the room can hear a little better. So is there anyone with the first question for us? This gentleman is in the middle there. Um, uh, I think 30 years ago, you, you, you were at the icebreaker in Amsterdam. Good. And you, you, you said to us, I'm practicing in the forest <laughs> with wind, uh, with opposite winds, because that's why I, I, I try to perfect my technique. Is, is that still happening or? Do I play in a forest? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> um, I like, you know, playing outdoors is kind of nice because you don't have the acoustical uh, um, feedback from the sound of a room. And so it helps you with your sound, I think, because, you know, it's a natural sound. I don't know if, I think what you're remembering yeah. is a tune that I played on that concert called Under Redwoods. Oh, yeah. And that, the story about that tune was one where I had been on holiday with my wife in California and we had some friends that had a little cabin in the redwood forest. And so I would go out on the deck of the cabin every day and play. 
And the redwoods are these huge trees, sequoias also they're called. And it's like playing in a cathedral, you know. And the sound of the instrument just goes up and the trees kind of reflect it back. And uh, so that song came from there. And I think I might have mentioned that oh, at the yeah, concert. Yeah. What I remember about the concert, too, is two of my heroes uh, turning up and sitting right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, one of them was Ray Brown and the other one was Bert Turetsky. Oh, yeah. And uh, they were both there to play and, and, and give workshop and so on. And I walked out on stage, and there they were, right in front of me. So, you know, just had to take a deep breath and, you know, get into it. <laughs> did you talk to Ray about the, uh, transcribing his recordings when you were starting out? And uh, did you ever really get into talking bass Yeah, with Ray when Brown? I first met uh, Ray was somewhere on the road, I remember. When I first came to New York, you know, it was 1968. And we were somewhere, and uh, we had breakfast together. And of course, it was my first time actually meeting him in person. And I had, um, when I was about 16, I just started playing acoustic bass, but not in public. I was playing bass guitar still. And there was, I read in a music paper that Ray Brown and Oscar Peterson had started a music school in Canada. So I wrote a letter to them you know, hoping to go and study, because, you know, Ray was my whole reason for playing the acoustic bass at the time, and still is an inspiration, of course. So I wrote the letter, I waited weeks and weeks, nothing came back, and finally I got a letter back, and, but it said, I'm afraid we've suspended operations. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I told him about this, and, uh, and of course I told him how much his music meant to me, and what an inspiration he's been. And the other Ray Brown thing I would just tell you was I played a festival and Ray had played right before we went on to play. And Ray was standing in a certain spot on the stage and when they set us up, they put me exactly where he'd been standing. And I have to tell you that there was some energy there that I could feel that he'd left behind when he played. And it was, it was a little bit kind of, oh, Wow, I, you know, it was like that. Yeah, amazing musician. Absolutely, amazing. yeah. So who else? We play a tune tonight, I think, maybe that's dedicated to him. Oh, fantastic. That I wrote, yeah. Well, I think we well, need to hear that. That sounds okay. exciting. Who, who'd like to go next? Who has a question for Dave Holland? A gentleman on the front row. When you figure out tunes, do you figure it out also behind the piano or an chord instrument? You're speaking of composing? Uh, yeah, no, yeah. no or, or studying a new song. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a terrible piano player, you know. Um, that's, uh, the, the, but I can sit at the piano and work out, you know, voicings and melodies and sl slowly. I can't perform on it, you know. But it's a tremendous tool, and I use it both for studying and for composing as well. And, uh, you know, when, for instance, I played a lot of Kenny Wheeler tunes, which were very inspirational to me. Um, Kenny had a way of writing chord sequences that was quite unique at the time I met him in the 60s and remained very individual, you know. So when Kenny would send me some music to learn for a recording or something like that, of course I would take it to the piano and try to figure out what his logic is in terms of how he saw the chord sequences because he didn't write very much diatonic sequences, you know, we say two, five, one, and like that. He wrote much more in a, a kind of modal fashion where each chord had a, a resolution but it wasn't the normal five, one resolution. And, and so sometimes you would have to, you know, figure those things out, what the continuity was between chords. And often in the melody that he would write, that would be the clue. Because in the melody, he would connect the adjacent chords by having some kind of, let's say, there'd be four notes in the chord that would be, or in the scale, that would be the same on two adjacent chords. And so that would give a continuity to them. So I learned a lot from Kenny's music and, uh, and uh, you know, how he imagined harmonic progressions. And, uh, uh, you know, I. I have uh, tried to build on those things that I learned from him. On, on Kenny Wheeler, one of the, the high points I really feel of, um, uh, of the 90s was Angel Song. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. such a beautiful recording, and yeah. I always point people to that um, yeah. as a representation of, of your work and also mm. um, the others uh, on the record. Could you maybe speak about the sessions? How did they, 
do, what, do you have any memories of, the, of that recording session and, uh, and the way that you went about putting together the pieces with Kenny Wheeler and rehearsing? Well, it? Kenny was nice enough to send me some music out front, so I had a chance to look at it. I always like to do some preparation if possible. Um, I feel like preparation is very helpful, you know, if you kind of start to get a feel for the music before you actually have to play it and record it and so on. So that was the first thing. And then uh, I don't, we didn't really rehearse, as far as I remember, for the, for the date. We did all the run-throughs in the studio. And it was, you know, the ECM recordings are usually, at least that time, I haven't recorded for ECM for a while now, but uh, the, the maximum you would use is two days for the recording. That sure. would be it. So um, that's what we did. We did it in New York and... Uh, of course, some great musicians on it, Bill and, and yeah. Lee and, and Kenny. And has a very open feel that feels very special to that recording, I feel. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the instrumentation helped to provide that. And uh, I think it's also the way we, there was a shared kind of idea for how, we didn't really talk about it, but how we could create uh, uh, the sound of what that music needed, you know. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, working with Bill was very important for me. So Bill Fazell, the guitar player. Yeah, Bill was, uh, you know, has a way of playing that, that really helped, I think, the whole uh, um, forward movement of the music. Yeah. And um, I think that was a key element in the sound of the music and the sound of the group, yeah. Yeah, very special recording. So. Let's have the next question now. I'm just aware that I'm struggling to see the back row. So maybe if we just yeah, focus on, is, is there someone yeah. on the back row who'd like to ask a question or further to the back? You might have to be quite pronounced with your arm shaking because I'm struggling to see. I'd like to ask a question, please. Sir, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, with your uh, being a prolific bass player and the uh, prolific composer and bass player that you are, have you ever in your whole career experimented with or thought about a different tuning? No. <laughs> I have enough trouble with the tuning I have, you know. <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I've had various friends and colleagues, you know, that have tried and still play. Of course, Red Mitchell played a fifth tuning. Uh, there's other options, of course. Um, I, yeah, no, I, I feel, you know, I'm kind of a traditional kind of guy, really, you know. So. When you were doing your solo records, was it something that you thought, hmm, is this the time to maybe? No. No, it never yeah. occurred to me, honestly. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, I, I'm happy. I used, when I was playing cello, which was for a little while now, um, I was using cello tuning sure. you know, in fifths. So I, I felt the instrument sounded better that way. And also I liked the different options that it gave me for things like double stops and arpeggiation and stuff like that. And uh, I use the Bach cello suites a lot to, to learn about the instrument mm. because Bach wrote so beautifully for it. And it informed me a lot in terms of how to, um, how to use what I learned there for the solo concerts, even on the bass, because, you know, he has a way of writing in those suites, or not just the suites, but in all the solo music that he wrote, where he creates the whole harmony just with single lines. And of course, when you're playing the bass, um, you want to try and give some clarity to the harmonic movement of the music without just playing roots and like that. And so it gave me a lot of uh, ideas for how to set up, um, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to play a certain note, you can set it up with the harmony behind it, as Bach did in those suites. So, um, that was very helpful. But as far as tuning, no, I haven't uh, approached it. I just got a, a, a short scale bass guitar that has a low B string, which I'm enjoying. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm starting to play the bass guitar again lately. So yeah, the What's last it? record I did has some tracks of bass guitar. There's in some it. seriously inspiring players at this festival, so I'm sure you'll get to, uh, oh, yeah. you get to enjoy any of them. Uh, uh, Yann Unfortunately, King. I have to hit the road tonight, yeah. believe it or not. Yeah, we're going to Gosh. Berlin tonight, so. Gosh, that's great. Uh, but uh, I wish I could stay, honestly. I saw the list of people here. and It's a really wonderful yeah, event. You're, you're lucky, lucky to be together. able to hear all this music. I know, I'm look, very much looking forward to it. So let's have some more questions, please. I, there's a hand going talking just about the Bach cello suites. How do you use that music in your improvisations? 
Well, I, I don't use that music, but it, what I was speaking of was the way Bach utilizes a single monophonic instrument like flute or, you know, cello, you can do double stops, but like the flute sonatas, the violin sonatas, the cello sonatas, you know, they're wonderful examples of how a solo instrument can create the whole music, bass lines, yeah. harmony and melody all at once. And so that's what I was speaking of as far as using what I learned there. Um, you know, it wasn't that I was really, you know, interjecting things from the suites, but it was more the concept that he had for writing for a solo instrument. And that informed me a little bit, like, a, say, like a tune like Charles Mingus's uh, Pork Pie Hat. You know, if I play that as a solo, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about also outlining the harmonic content of the song as well as playing melodic ideas. So. Uh, I think the cello suites and the other solo suites are demonstrations of that idea, and that's that's how uh, how I related to them. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I see a hand over here. Just uh, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. You just mentioned goodbye, perfect. I, I was just wondering when the form is the end of its so long. Um, how do you manage to create these ideas that? So just for the room, so you're asking about developing ideas over a long form yeah. piece like Goodbye, Paul by Hat. Well, um, you know, the first thing is, of course, to study all the aspects of the music, melody, harmony, and rhythm. You know, we deal a lot with harmony and rhythm as bass players, of course, as rhythm section players. But melody is one thing that's so important and anybody I speak to who is asking some question that's similar to this, you know, I say, please learn all the melodies you can. They're, they're, they're key to, you know, you can't play mel melodically unless you study melody. That's the simple answer. Um, but as far as the, I think what you're asking also is about how one idea leads to another. And if you think about music as it is, which is a language, it's a language just like we're speaking now. And when I'm speaking to you now, I'm not thinking about the words I'm gonna say in 30 seconds. I'm just letting my idea roll and each idea goes into the next and into the next and my underlying that is a concept that I'm trying to relate to your question and that question is getting an answer and as I talk, it comes out. And that's the same thing with the music. You know, you start off with an idea. And one of the important things for me that I'm still learning, actually, and I'm, this is something that I find really quite preoccupying me at the moment, is to be patient and let the ideas come rather than to just fill up space all the time with what you're playing. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to learn how to use space more. And uh, I think if you, study all the things I speak of, melody, harmony, and rhythm, and you study the great soloists, not just bass players, but you, you listen to how they pace their solos or how, you know, how they build their concepts. You know. I go back and listen to Charlie Parker and, and try to, you know, I have that Omni book of Charlie Parker and I practice those things as well, and uh, you know, this is inspiring as well. All this stuff sort of adds up, and, it, and then you just kind of, you just let it happen. You don't force it. You know, you just kind of let take a deep breath and you just launch into the music. And uh, you learn each time you play, you know, you learn, oh, maybe I was playing a little too much. Uh, maybe I wasn't waiting for the idea to happen. Let me, maybe tonight I'll try and be a bit more patient. Or, you know, things like that. Not to get paranoid with yourself, you know, and, oh, you know. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't think you should be super critical, but you know, have a little thought about where you're going all the time. What's the next thing you'd like to develop in your music? What's, what do you feel is going to complement what you already know? And how can you enhance that and take it forward? You know, um, I did a lot of work on phrasing, resolution, uh, phrasing, rhythmic phrasing, uh, rhythmic cycles, you know, uh, taking 
different time signatures, but also rhythmic patterns, you know, seven and five and all different patterns, three over four, and, you know, just practicing rhythm as a separate thing. And then thinking about resolution, you know, and by that I mean resolution, uh, where it happens, harmonic resolution can, you know, we see bar lines, but the bar lines, if you look at Charlie Parker's playing, he doesn't resolve on one. He might delay the resolution two beats into the next bar, you know. So there's, you know, once you get to that point in your playing, you can almost start on every, any note and make it work, you know. Somebody said to me once, if you play a note and it's the wrong note, if you move half a step up or half a step down, it'll be right. And it's kind of like that, you know, because if you play a note and then you can resolve into the next note. So resolutions are the, another key thing. And Charlie Parker's music, he was amazing at creating resolutions. Uh, Art Tatum, I listened a lot to Art Tatum this last year because of his uh, harmonic language it was incredible, you know. Charlie Parker took a job as a dishwasher in Harlem where Tatum was working just so he could listen to him every night. You know. um, let's have, uh, any more questions? I see a gentleman just down here at the front. Is it just before you do so? Is there anyone at the back? Because I'm struggling to see past the... Yeah. Uh, I think this gentleman just at the far, if we go to you and then we'll come back to you, sir, if that's okay. So fire away, please. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned practicing the rhythm just now. I was wondering if you ever... Practice uh, timing, so like where you play on the beat, and if you have any kind of you know insight in terms of when you're in a setup with a new drummer or a new piano player, uh, do you take some time to listen to their timing? Do you have to analyze it, or is it just a feeling thing? You know, this player plays more or less behind. I don't know, like any kind of insight. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, you know, it's it's to me the it's the feeling really is what it is. The, you know, if you try to analyze it in an intellectual way, it, you get into trouble, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, like, should I play a little bit more on the beat or a little more ahead of the beat or a little bit behind? You know, my way of pr learning about it was, first of all, uh, well, was from playing with good musicians, of course, as many good musicians as you can and learning from them. Uh, but play I played a lot with records. And, you know, I, when I was a teenager, you know, I was playing along with Ray Brown records and Leroy Vinegar and then, uh, you know, uh, drummers like Elvin Jones and Tony Williams and Roy Haynes and Philly Joe Jones. And I just play along with the records and try to really lock in in a, in a way that felt right. That's a, it was just a feeling. You know, my beginnings of music were, were really coming into the music you know, when I was around 10 or 11, I was hearing this music called Skiffle in London, in England, and then um, rock and roll and things like that. So, you know, feel was, was learned just by listening to the records and learning to play the grooves, you know, the R&B grooves, Johnny B. Good and, you know, Bo Diddley and all that stuff. And uh, I think it's just an accumulative sense of where the beat should be. Now, the other part of your question is interesting because playing with different drummers, and of course, one of the things I always listen to is the cymbal beat. And I'll give you a good example, I think. Uh, I, it was a good fortune to both play with Elvin Jones and Eddie Blackwell. Now, Eddie Blackwell's from New Orleans, played with Ornette Coleman, and has, a, has that New Orleans kind of strut to his playing. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, I don't know how to explain it, it's just this kind of, real kind of, you know, thing. Uh, it's that, I can't explain it really. And Elvin's got this kind of rolling kind of, you know, thing. It's just kind of waves of stuff. And um, I feel like in the, in the, in the music, the drummer the, is the, uh, sets the pace. Now, that's not to say the bass player doesn't have a great contribution to make and also cont contribute the feel that the bass player has as well. Uh, but we want to find a meeting point, right? That's the ideal situation is where we're listening to each other, the drummer and myself, and finding a place where we can swing together. Yeah. And by swing, I don't mean dun, 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 dun. it could be funk, it could be any kind of thing, a bossa nova, but they all have to swing, you know? And uh, so listening to that and just 
giving yourself time to find the spot as well, you know, instead of jumping in and feeling like, oh, I've got to play all my stuff right away, you know, just like, you know, cool it a little bit, you know, two in a bar, four, you know, just find where it is first and then build on that. I've noticed rehearsals, you know, when you play with a musician that's really experienced, they don't play everything at once, you know. They, they play, they find their way into the music in an easy way and then as they as they feel it out, that's when you start hearing the music start to develop and come out. But patience is a really important thing, you know, to be patient about yourself, to give yourself room to learn and to grow and to, and to uh, feel what the music needs. And that's what I'm always thinking about. What is it I can do that's going to make the music, that's going to contribute to making this music um, as good as I can contribute, you know. So um, you have to just, as I say, be patient and, and let the music come to you, you know. It's really beautiful. So on the second row, I believe we have a question here. Okay. Yeah, uh, you had collaborated with people like Emma Ibrahim and Zakir Hussain who mm. are playing their own cultural music, mm. which could be, uh, which could be, it could be said that it's a bit of foreign music play, jazz play in the first instance at least. How did you go about internalizing their own music from your own perspective? Did you study their, uh, like Indian music or uh, Middle Eastern music? Um, uh, I didn't, not to the extent that Indian musicians study. I mean, the, the, the study uh, regimen for Indian musicians is incredible. I mean, I, I spoke much, a lot with Zakir and what he did as a young musician and uh, uh, it, you know it's very rigorous um, but I listened a lot to it you know it became very popular in the 60s with Ravi Shankar and of course uh, Zakir's father was the tabla player Ala Raka with Shankar and, uh, and Zakir in fact played with him as well when his father was not able to do it um, so I had the sound of the music you know but the the internal workings of it and all the different ragas and things but certainly, during that period, both John McLaughlin and I uh, got interested in Indian music, and John made a real pursuit of it, as you know, and went very deeply into it. And uh, um, I took from it what I felt I could find useful without going into that kind of intense learning thing. In other words, learning about the rhythm cycles and how they think mathematically about breaking things down and so on. Um, the, the Middle Eastern music, uh, of course, again, I've, I've, it was in my ear, but Anwar's music is also written with an understanding of Western musicians as well. So he's not asking me to play quarter tones and things like this, you know. Um, so I think one of the things about the music we play as, as improvisers, as jazz musicians, is it's a very inclusive music. And we include a lot of things in our playing. And I've always included things I've heard from other cultures in there. Um, another project I did with some flamenco musicians a few years ago with a great guitarist uh, from the Carmona family, uh, Pepe Habichuela. And uh, again, that was a, a thing that I had to immerse myself in because that was not about finding a meet, that was about me getting into their world. And I took three years of visiting Madrid and doing concerts in Spain uh, uh, over that three-year period. Um, I didn't stay there for three years, but I would go there frequently. And Pepe was teaching me about the song forms. And of course, nothing's written down. And uh, I had to, they, they don't even count things in. And they, you know, they, they're not thinking about keys. It's where the capo is. And, it's a, it's a music that's just internalized. And I know of some of the songs at rehearsals, I was figuring out the wrong the cycle. Because the harmony was resolving in the middle of the rhythmic cycle, I thought that was one. So I was writing out some parts for myself because they, there was no parts. So, uh, and then I'd come and then I suddenly realized, oh, wow, no, this is all in the wrong place. <laughs> I got to figure it out from another place now. So. so all this stuff to me is things that, are, that have added to the language 
um, that I can draw on when I'm playing. And in fact, some music I've written has also, I think, been influenced by both the flamenco and Middle Eastern music. So um, I, I, I think, uh, you know, in, as I said, jazz musicians uh, work in many different contexts. And, and we, the building blocks of the music actually are shared, even though there are characteristics that are different, some of the building blocks are the same. Okay, so now let's have some more questions then. Now I'm gonna try and have a look. Okay, do you want to fire away? Can I ask you a question? Go for it. When you're playing the bass, how do you feel about playing the bass as an extension of your own character? <laughs> well, you know, bass players are such nice people, you know. I mean. <laughs> no, you know, we're easy going, you know. I, I think, I'm not saying, it, I've met, you know, a few different kinds of people, but generally, I, I think because of the instrument, you know, first of all, we have to carry the thing all the time, you know, so that's immediately, you know, you're, you're serving the instrument to a certain extent. No, but um, it's also where the bass is in the music. It's a supportive role in a lot of times. So, I, you know, I think bass players are happy sometimes to be in that position. And, and then sometimes I think for bass players, it's difficult to step out. I know when I started my first band, working band in 82, uh, it was a big step. I called my first record at that time, uh, Jumping In, because that's what it was felt like, you know, it was like jumping in the deep end of the, of the swimming pool. Uh, it's like sink or swim, you know, and uh, I had been working with Betty Carter uh, for a year during the mid-70s, and we had become friends. Um, happy to say. And when I started the band, she said to me, Dave, you know, you got to, you know, your name's out front now. I said, well, I, I just want to have a band that, where everybody's, you know, can share and share and share. She said, that's nice. Yeah. But you got to take charge. You got to make decisions. What's the, what's the music you're going to play? And, you know, things like that. And, and I, th I thought, yeah, okay, that's, and it took a little while to, 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 to take that step. So um, as far as the instrument and how I feel about it, uh, the sonority of the bass just, you know, just feels like the right sound that, to express what I feel. The string, I've always been a string player. I started with ukulele, then guitar, then bass guitar, and then acoustic bass, and then cello. So strings have always been the thing for me. And, um, you know, uh, when I heard Ray Brown and Leroy Vinegar on record, that's what got me. I said, that sound, is, uh, that's, what, that's how I want to play. You know, I want to make that sound on the bass. And so I tried to model my sound for a long time on those two players and then Mingus for a while. And, of course, you realize after a few years that there's no way you're ever going to sound like anybody else except yourself. So what you then do is you start to really think about, you take all the things you've learned by trying to copy your heroes, and then you try and find the sound that expresses who you are. And that's, that's when you start to really individualize your music. And um, I think that happened to me sort of in my early 20s. I began, I'd spent that apprenticeship time, you know, trying to emulate my heroes. And, and then I said, okay, now it's time for me to decide how, what sound, what sound on the bass is going to express the feeling I have inside me, and that's that's when you start to look for that, you know. Do you also experience limitations in your own playing? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Without limitations, it would all be over. <laughs> you know, you give up. What, what, why keep going if you don't have limitations? You know, the limitations are what give you a chance to grow. And, uh, you know, I, I welcome the challenges of that. I think that there's also other challenges as you get older, you know? I mean, um, to keep that open-mindedness, to keep uh, uh, an attitude of learning and curiosity. And uh, that's something that I don't find difficult because I've, I've always been curious about the music and I hear something, I, I want to find out about it. It doesn't matter what genre 
If it's interesting, I'm interested. Um, so the limitations, uh, uh, you know, there's the, the obviously physical limitations to the instrument, although as time goes by, you realize people are challenging those limitations. I went to an International Society of Bassists meeting a few years ago, and I had some young players that, I mean, they were playing violin sonatas on the bass and, and things, you know. I, I, it was things that were unimaginable, you know. When I first heard the Gary Carr solo record that he did in 1966 or something, uh, it was phenomenal. And, fr and fr Francois Rabat, you know, uh, another great bass player that was recording then. And then, of course, Scott LaFaro and, uh, you know, and Ray and, and you know, the barriers just keep being pushed further and further, and I don't know what if there's any end to it. You know, each of us try to try to find uh, uh, um, uh, a way to contribute to the evolution of the instrument as well. I think, and uh, yeah, but there's nothing wrong with limitations. I mean, it's a it's, it it defines a, an area of work for you, and then you just try and keep pushing a little bit and opening it up. So. You mentioned Scott Lafaro there, and I was um, just a side note in your story that, that when uh, Philly, jo Philly Joe Jones recommended you for the Miles gig. No, oh, but that's, he was ah. there, but he, he, uh, he, ta he gave me the message from Miles. Ah, okay. The, the, the gig. No, I know, it, it's, he, he was in the club. He was living in London at that time. But, but were you playing in a, in, a, in a band that was playing before um, uh, Bill Evans, mm. because I read this today and I was thinking 68 it would have been Eddie Gomez, I believe, on bass. Eddie Gomez so and Jack Dijonet. I mean, how could you remember that? <laughs> just the, the idea of you meeting Eddie Gomez and, and Bill yeah. Evans at that time, it just feels like such an exciting moment. And then the way that your life changed from that, you know, yeah. from that concert, it's pretty special that those things were oh, happening. No you doubt. would have been buzzing, I imagine, just to meet Bill Evans and uh, yeah. let alone all these other things. Maybe you could speak well, on I that. was lucky yeah. enough from about 1966 to work quite frequently at Ronnie Scott's and Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club. And sometimes I'd play with a visiting American artist like uh, Ben Webster sometimes or Coleman Hawkins. Sure. Or, um, and, uh, and Joe Henderson I played with uh, 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 Vi Red, who was a a, a saxophone player, alto saxophone player, very good. Um, but a lot of time I was in the support band and I was, you know, would work opposite Max Roach's band. So I got to meet Jimmy Merritt, who was playing bass, a lovely man. Yeah. I got to meet Jimmy Garrison, who was playing with Archie Shep's band. Wow. Uh, and I got to meet Eddie. And of course, all this stuff was just wonderful for me as a young player. And Eddie was the first musician I saw who addressed the instrument with a kind of side technique on the right hand. And I'd been kind of using a two-finger technique, sort of turned a little bit, but not all the way. And so watching him play for a month, because it was a month-long gig, you know, at the, in those days, uh, was great, yeah. And Jack was in the band, and Jack and I had become friends on a, some other visits he'd made to London with uh, Charles Lloyd. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then a couple of times with Bill. And, uh, and so I think Jack, he never told me that he did, but I think Jack might have put in a good word for me. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and so, yeah, that's what happened. I was, that was 1968, and I was planning on going to New York that year uh, in the fall, because all these musicians I'd met from New York, they, you know, I, I would say, oh, what's New York? Yeah, you should come, come on, man, you know, we'll try and help you out. So I was gonna come. And Rashid Ali, I, I got to meet him. He came to London for a few months after Coltrane died. And, uh, <laughs> and so anyway, all those plans changed because in August, you know, Miles uh, asked me to come and play with his band. And I didn't know how long it was going to last. It was just a three-week gig in Harlem that I came over to do. And on the first night, uh, Rashid Ali came into the club to see Miles and he said, what are you doing here, Dave? I looked up there and your white face was up there on the bandstand. What's going on? <laughs> I mean, he was joking, you know. And uh, I said, I don't know. I just, he asked me to join the band. How did, he, how did Miles contact you? Was it a phone call? I imagine he didn't whispering voice. I didn't voice speak or, to him until after the first set. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I, uh, Philly Joe, you know, the, the, we were playing opposite Bill, right? So we would play the first set, Bill the second, and we played the third set. Bill played the fourth, and then we played the fifth set. 
So that one went on around one o'clock in the morning. And uh, so as I was going on for that last set, F Philly came to the bandstand and he said, Dave, come here. I said, what's up? Miles got a message for you. He wants you to join his band. I said, man, come on. You're <laughs> kidding me. He said, no, he wants to talk to you after the gig, you know. Okay, fine. So I was playing a very nice gig. It was with a singer and a piano trio. Nothing like... Uh, earth-shaking, you know, super modern or anything, but very nice. And I was just playing the gig, you know, and luck I knew he was in the club, but I didn't think he was going to be listening, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't about to be showing off and I, you look at me, you know, like this, because anyway, he would never have given me the gig if that had happened. Um, so anyway, Philly said he wants to talk to you after the set, so after the set was over, I put the bass down and I went looking for him and he'd gone. And... Uh, I found Philly, and he said, he said I said, what's going on? He, he, did he want to talk to me or not? He said, oh, he's gone back to the hotel, but he wants you to call him tomorrow at the hotel. Okay. So the next morning, about 10 o'clock, I called the hotel. Oh, can I speak to Miles Davis, please? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they said, oh, I'm afraid he's, uh, he's checked out. He's gone back to America. He's gone back to New York. Okay, thank you. And so then I called Philly Joe. I said, look, is this real or not? You know, what's going on? Oh, no, he wouldn't ask you if he wasn't real. He said, just sit tight. You'll hear something. Okay. A week went by, two weeks went by. <laughs> my phone's ringing off the hook, right? All my friends, what's happening, Dave? You know, you going? What's going on? Uh, I don't know what's happening. Another week went by. So I started a gig at the Ronnie Scott's with Joe Henderson. And we played the first night. And I came back home, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang, and it was his manager, Jack Whittemore. And he sounded just like the kind of image you would see in a cartoon. I could see the big cigar. And, yeah. <laughs> hey, Dave. Yeah. Like this. I said, he said, Miles wants you to come over and play with his band. Uh, can you come? This was a Tuesday night. He said, can you be here Thursday? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't have, you know, I, I had all my life was there. I left my car on the street. I moved out of the, you know, packed a suitcase. I did the Wednesday night with Joe. I went to the American Embassy, got a visa to go and visit. And, uh, and I was on the plane on Thursday night. I had did to you go take to your base? Of course. Yeah. Hey, in those days, it was easy. I, I just turned up. They sent me one ticket. Oh. And I turned up with the bass in a soft case at the boarding gate with my bass. And I said, oh, I've got a bass fiddle. Have you got somewhere I could put it? Oh, yes, of course. No problem. <laughs> Come this way. And would you like the, uh, the bulkhead seat? You can have two seats if you'd like. It. <laughs> I mean, those are good days. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, I got to New York. And then that night, I had to go to Herbie's house to, to see him. And uh, um, I... I I knew quite a bit of the music. Herbie said, do you know any of the music? I said, well, I've been listening to the records, of course. But some of Wayne's shorter tunes, uh, I can't quite figure out the chord sequences. You know, Ron doesn't always play the roots and, you know, what's going on. So he taught me those. And I had these little bits of paper I put in the piano for the first night. And one of the things that Miles said to me after the first set, he said, leave the music at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, he said he didn't want any music on the bandstand, so... But, um, yeah, what, a, what an amazing That's moment. Heavy. Well, I could ask you loads of questions, but of I know course. that there were no, the people please, I'm sorry, in I the was room going, that would... I was going on I, No, bit. I'd I love to talk to you more about this, but I see there's a gentleman with his hand yeah, up just on the please. third row. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, you were talking about the first band project, uh, Dave von der Quintet jumping in, and you uh, had to make decisions. You decided to leave out any harmony instrument. Was it as a challenge, or to have more, more space as a bass yeah, well, you know, all through the 70s, I'd been doing a lot of playing with groups that didn't have a chordal instrument. There can be a tendency for the piano to just fill up everything, you know. And I love the kind of piano players like Monk, Andrew Hill, Duke Ellington, uh, Herbie Hancock, you know, where they know when to play and when not to play. And they, can, they don't feel like they have to supply chords for every bar, every chord change, you know, it's like... Uh, 
it gives it gives more freedom to the harmonic movement and also gives you a chance to manipulate and reharmonize things in a way when 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 all the harmony is not being stated all the time so then you can start building alternative uh, paths harmonically that aren't just the paths that were originally written in the song so that kind of flexibility is what I'm looking for so then the next chordal instrument I had was a vibraphone, which is Steve Nelson, amazing musician. And that again, he's just four mallets is the maximum that he would use. So every voicing had to have four, four voices to it. Same with the guitar, there was you know limited number of voicings. So it tended towards more open type of voicings in the music, which gave that <laughs> flexibility still. So Dave, we're getting towards the end, wrapping up yeah. the session. But I have one last question because we're in a room full of bass players, all on our journey, trying to play our best music. Could you share some advice that you feel would be useful to us all? If you have a student come to you, what's the message that you would want to impart on them? Well, one of the first things I always say is that you have to develop your ability as a listener just as much as you develop your ability as a player. Uh, you can only play what you hear. And if you don't hear it, don't play it, you know? So, you know, obviously at the beginning, you're learning, as we say, licks and phrases that you hear from other players and you're putting it all together and you're piecing things together and making, trying to make it flow and everything. But then these, all these ideas start to get inside your ear. Like when I listen to Ray Brown a lot, I would find myself hearing a phrase in my head I never wrote any transcriptions down. I, I learned some solos early on, all the way through, just right off the record though. So you go straight to the instrument instead of putting it on paper. But, um, you know, sometimes I'd, I'd, I'd just listen to these records over and over and I'd, a phrase that Ray might play would sort of start coming into my head. I'd hear it. And then I'd, without the bass, I would try and imagine how I would play that phrase on the instrument. And that, you know, is a great thing. You can practice without the instrument. You can mock up the reality of your hands and how you would play it. And so when I'm traveling on tour, if we've got some music we're learning and putting into the programs and so on, you know, often I'll have this music going through my head while I'm traveling and I'm imagining solos and phrases and, and imagining how to play because once you once you have the muscle memory of of learning instruments scales arpeggios and all that stuff um, at least 80 percent i would say is mental clarifying the idea and then once you know and then getting your hands to respond automatically to that idea so as you think it it appears and that's a that's a process gary peacock told me that he used to put the bass down and think of a phrase and then try and clarify it and then he'd pick the bass up and try to play it straight off. And if he didn't play it right away, he'd put the bass down and think again until he got it right. Yeah, I love that. Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, it's such an important and message. The, and the only other thing I would say is Please. Uh, create a program for yourself of practice. Be thoughtful about that. And my practice, you know, it's no good me telling you what I practice because, you know, it's after many years of playing. You have to find what you need to do for where you're at right now. But I, I always practice uh, more or less technical things, warm-ups and all that stuff, scales and arpeggios, of course, and then creative practice. Those are the two areas that I work in. And I try to do that every day so that... Uh, and of course, some of them overlap. Sometimes you have to work out certain techniques in order to play certain things. But generally, like my, that's how my practices go. Um, I always try to start off with the, with the basic fundamentals. Kenny Wheeler would play long tones every morning. And he, it was like Trumpet 101, you know, just the beginner's exercises. He did that religiously until he, until he died, you know. It was amazing. Yeah. So... That's, 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing, uh, well, so much with all of us here today. I know it's thank been, you for the questions. Too. Yeah, the yeah. questions have been absolutely incredible. Yeah. It's been really wonderful. I'm afraid we do have to wrap up because Dave has to go prepare for his show this evening. But I want to thank uh, the technical crew that have helped us uh, present this for you, uh, all of you for asking your questions. And let me help me thank uh, Dave Holland one last time. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.